Hi, everyone, and welcome. Uh, today we're going to be presenting information about how to work with schools and School Wellness Policies 101. Today's session is brought to you by Action for Healthy Kids. My name is Amy Moyer. I am the Director of Field Operations here at Action for Healthy Kids. I'm based out of Houston, Texas. Also with me today is Jill Camper Davidson. She is our School Nutrition Manager and oversees our project with CDC out of Madison, Wisconsin. Jill also sits on her daughter's school board for Sun Prairie District in Wisconsin. She, she's got a really great perspective on helping us understand how school systems work and how we can most appropriately work with them. Before we really get going today, I want to make sure that everyone understands how to use today's technology. We are using GoToWebinar technology. All participants are in unmuted only mode, and this is to ensure that participants have a noise-free environment. Uh, if you have any questions throughout today's session, feel free to enter them in your question box uh, on the control panel located on your right-hand side. This call is being recorded, so you don't need to take notes frivolously. We will be sending out the recording and handouts following today's call. Again, if at any point you want to enter a question in the question box of your control panel, please do so. We're going to pause at a couple of points during our session, and we'll answer questions accordingly. So first, before we dive into the uh, process for how schools work and school wellness policies, I'd like to give you a little bit of background on who Action for Healthy Kids is, in case you're not familiar with us. Action for Healthy Kids is a national nonprofit, and our goal is to work to fight childhood obesity by helping schools become healthier places. Uh, we are moms, we're dads, we're teachers, we're students, we're school wellness experts and community members that have come together as professionals, as volunteers, as members of our community to make sure that our students are learning in healthy environments. And we believe that everyone has a part to play in the nation's childhood obesity epidemic. Uh, we're facing a big crisis in today's country, so we all must do our part. Uh, and with Action for Healthy Kids, one of our parts is to ensure that no matter what, what point in the school day a child walks in those doors, and no matter at what point they leave, that we're providing them with opportunities to practice healthy eating and being physically active. So not only are they learning about nutrition and how to live an active lifestyle in the classrooms, but they have lots of opportunities throughout the course of the day to practice it as well. This presentation is part of an Action for Healthy Kids Parent Leadership Series. You can see on the slide here that this is the number two and three parts of the series. Uh, we know that parents play a crucial role in helping to create healthy school communities, and generally speaking, healthy students and healthy families. We have found in our work that parents are typically the linchpins in ensuring that schools can progress in creating healthy school environments. So our goal with this parent leadership series is to help empower parents and give them the tools and resources they need to work most effectively with schools. If you've worked with schools at any point in the past, you know that schools are not always the easiest institutes to work with. They're under a lot of constraints themselves. And so what we're going to be covering today is information that will hopefully help you as a parent or as a professional learn how to most effectively work with schools. Remember throughout today's session, if you have any questions, feel free to enter it into your control panel. All right, so first we're going to start with how to work with schools. Understanding how school systems work is very important for getting wellness initiatives started, whether you're in a high school, middle school, or elementary school. If you don't do your homework in this area and really figure out how, who the champions are in your school building, it can oftentimes be a real barrier to your success in making action happen. During this part of the webinar, we're going to give you an overview of the school leadership structure, the different school groups that you may want to approach in trying to gain uh, interest in health and wellness initiatives, and provide you with some engagement strategies for building relationships with these groups in your school community. 
first up, let's talk about the public school leadership structure. And you may be thinking, well, why do I need to know this level of detail? And the answer is because there are different levels in which you're going to want to make contact with key individuals that will support your work. And it's important that you approach this at the right level in order to make action happen. What you see here is a graphic that generally provides an idea of how schools operate. Each school district is a little bit different. Each state operates a little bit differently. But generally speaking, this graphic will give you an idea of how school systems work. As you can see, students and parents are at the top because without them, there are no schools. The systems wouldn't exist. Then you can see that the school board is next on the hierarchy. The school board, as Jill could talk for hours and hours, um, school board members, they're elected by the public. They're ultimately responsible for overseeing a district's success. So the accountability plans, the budget, um, the superintendent's um, success lies in the hands of the school board. The superintendent, all the district level administrators, and any district level advisory team are below the board. You're most likely going to be working at the fourth or fifth level here, at the local school building level. Individual school leaders or building administrators, like the principal or the assistant principal, is oftentimes going to be probably your best first place. School improvement teams, we'll talk about those in a minute, or accountability teams could include parents, may include community members, school leaders, or others who are responsible for setting goals and putting plans in place to increase academic achievement. So these are the teams that make sure to hold the school and the school administrators accountable for achieving certain academic and health success. I'll we'll talk a little bit about parent committees, PTAs, PTOs. Uh, these organizations, if they're active within the school building, play a really large role in helping to guide the school culture. And then finally, your, your champions are also going to be found at the teacher and school staff level. Obviously, if you want to do a health initiative that impacts the classroom, getting teacher support is going to be key. So overall, when you look at this structure, administrators, especially the principal, are the key players in helping you achieve success in schools. So it's important to get their support at the very beginning. So let's talk about that. How do you engage your principal? And some of this is common sense. This is what we learned in kindergarten about how to introduce ourselves. Others may be uh, important to help you determine how to feel comfortable in working with your school principal. As I mentioned, principals at the local school building level really hold the greatest power to create a healthy or an unhealthy environment. A supportive principal can make a significant difference in the success of your wellness efforts. So if you don't have a good connection with the school, if you're a beginning parent, maybe your student is in kindergarten or you're new to the area, you can try to start with the principal and gauge that his or her interest level. First steps in, in action, excuse me, in engaging your principal, introduce yourself. Uh, you know, that's the key. It's always the hardest part sometimes, but just going up and introducing yourself at an an existing event or uh, as you're proceeding your way through the school day if you're volunteering, make sure make it a point to introduce yourself to the principal. Develop a friendly relationship. Try to make a point of chatting with the principal whenever you can. Show them that you're a dedicated parent who's on his or her side. Maybe you're at a PTO event, you're at fall fitness night, or you're having breakfast or lunch with your student. Wherever you have the opportunity, stop by and chat with the principal. Try to understand his or her vision, philosophy, and priorities, especially around health and wellness, to sort of gauge their interest. What do they have concerns about when it comes to implementing health and wellness programs? Do they have concerns that it's going to interfere with academic time? Is it going to negatively influence test scores? Do they have issues with other parents getting engaged, just lack of parent engagement in general? Or are there big time behavior issues across the student population? As you're listening to the parent, excuse me, the principal's concerns, think about ways to present your ideas as possible solutions to those concerns. 
And then, of course, after you feel that you've developed a good relationship with your principal, schedule a meeting. And if at all possible, involve other parents. Uh, if you've got a couple of other moms or dads who have a vested interest in health and wellness and have a comfort level in approaching the principal together, that can always be an important um, step in helping to develop the relationship with the principal. Especially because principals react to issues they see as important to many parents. At this meeting, after you've listened to all the principal's concerns, you can explain your own concerns in a positive manner and present your ideas for addressing them. Let's say, for example, your, your, your schools cut recess. They may only have it one or two days a week, or maybe not at all, or it's five or ten minutes long. You, have a, you know that recess needs to be every day for at least 20, or 20 minutes or so. So go in and talk to the principal, address your concerns, um, show research that supports recess helping with behavior issues, recess, connecting to better memory recall uh, in the afternoon. Um, there's lots of research out there. So just be open and try to discuss your concerns with the principal and be willing to help out in uh, working around any challenges he or she may face. Try to avoid, if at all possible, adding anything to the principal's to-do list. Emphasize that you and your team will do the work and all you're asking for from the principal is permission and support. That's going to be key. So let's talk a little bit about school groups. So depending on your project, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish, some of the school groups that are listed on this slide may be good relationships, build, uh, good opportunities for you to build relationships with. These might include the classroom teachers. For example, if you want to initiate a no food as a reward program, if you want to initiate a classroom energizer, classroom teachers may be an excellent source uh, and, and a group that you'd want to build a relationship with. If you want to talk about after school snacks or uh, taste tests and you would like to bring in more taste tests to the schools to the students, the food service department might be the place to start. Physical activity, physical education, needs around uh, getting kids active throughout the course of the school day. The PE department or PE teacher may be your best place. PTO, PTA, as I mentioned earlier, is a really strong advocate for students in general. Oftentimes, too, it's filled with parents, and so it's a great place for you to go in and garner support of parents that will help um, do the work in the school and also help ensure that you've got the administrative buy-in you need. Before and after school programs, you know, if you have a need for um, developing physical activity and nutrition initiatives in before and after school programs, your site directors or on-site staff that handle those programs may be good places to start. You see here, too, parent support specialists or family resource staff. These are oftentimes available at Title I schools, so schools with more than 40% of students eligible for free and reduced lunch. These are very high need schools. And then, of course, accountability or school improvement teams. Oftentimes, a parent or other members of the community may sit on this team. As I mentioned earlier, they, this is the group that holds the school accountable for academic success in other areas like health and wellness. So this may be a good group for you to start with in understanding what kinds of accountability measures are set in place around student health and wellness. So here you can see that the accountability or school improvement team is a formal team. It's made up of teachers, school leaders, typically like the school principal, community members, and parents. The team develops goals for the school, which lay out in a document, oftentimes called the school improvement plan. Uh, this school improvement plan varies by school, but it usually relates to academic achievement or improving the school climate or culture in some way, shape, or form. Safe routes to school, um, healthy food served on campus, 30 to 45 minutes of physical activity for, throughout the course of the school day for every student each day of the week. The school improvement plan helps set the direction that schools take on any one of those topics. So as a result, the school improvement plan may be the best place 
to house wellness goals because again, this is what's holding the school accountable for these activities. Also, because the school improvement plan is likely to be reviewed and evaluated on a regular basis. So it's oftentimes more scrutinized and reviewed than PTA projects or other initiatives that may be going on throughout the course of the school day. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jill, who's going to talk about some action steps for engaging some of these school groups. Jill, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, we talked about engaging the principal already. We talked about this up front because it is so critical to engage the, your principal before you even get started. So let's talk about the action steps for engaging other school groups. The first two steps are the same. You introduce yourself and you develop a friendly relationship. And this is a relationship with the key people in whatever areas you will be working. So for example, you wanted to do taste testing. Visit the school's cafeteria. Ask about trying lunch. Talk to the staff that are working in the cafeteria. So they realize that what you want to do isn't going to be something that's going to be threatening or more work for them. Becoming an active part of the PTO, PTA, or other parent groups let you understand what's happening in terms of fundraising or what they're doing for projects in the school. Become a volunteer in the classroom so you can be there and get a sense of the school day and what sort of things happening. Or volunteer for PE events or before and after school programs. Consider joining the accountability or school improvement team. And this is different in every district, but um, usually they have some type of performance improvement plan or a committee or something that a citizen or a parent can get involved with. People will take you more seriously if they know you are interested and involved in the different areas of the school community. Become familiar with requirements that relate to your project. This may be the National School Lunch and Breakfast Program guidelines, physical activity standards, and what we may have for other standards, for example, Common Core, and what's happening in academics. Try to truly gain an understanding of the overarching role that these policies play in guiding or mandating many aspects of how school works. During other sessions in this parent leadership series, we will address these types of policies in more detail. Fourth, approach key people with questions you might have. Try to understand their priorities, their philosophy, their approach. State any concerns in a positive manner and make sure that you want to work with them to find solutions that can benefit everyone. And oftentimes, by being able to ask questions up front like this, you understand the process and what's happening so that things become clearer down the road. Step five is showing your support by listening and researching and then offering suggestions. That's by offering solutions that you and your team can help implement so that you're not creating extra work for the school staff. And six, ask for feedback in a way that makes it clear that you understand that who you're working with are the experts in their areas. They are likely to have insight on the best ways to make your project a success. And when you respect their authority, they will be much more willing to work with you. As you get to know the principal and other key players and groups, find out if any wellness efforts are already taking place. Is there a school or district wellness team, sometimes called a school health advisory council or a SHAC? What about the wellness policy in your district? Is it something that's active, or is it a policy that's just basically on the book? Is the school improvement team or accountability team working on any wellness issues? Who or anyone, or who in the district is the main wellness contact for the school? These topics will be covered in more detail in a different session. Additional tips for engaging school groups. First of all, be patient and understanding. Progress in schools can often seem very slow. And sometimes what you see on the surface is only a, you know, the tip of the iceberg on what's happening behind the scenes. Remember that many schools have day-to-day -day concerns, and sometimes it can be very difficult for school staff to focus on anything but the immediate concern. Offer to help as much as you can. At the same time, be persistent with your efforts. Show the benefits your initiatives will have for them. Respect the hierarchy. Don't try to undermine anyone or circumvent anyone and make sure all the necessary people are aware of what you're doing. 
in addition, when you look at that hierarchy, that means that you can't just go to a board member or the district administrator and say, oh, I want to have healthy snacks. Because they will say, well, have you talked to the principal? And the principal would be where you would start and work your way through that way. And if you don't get what you want from the principal, then it would be going up the chain of command that way. That's the best way to get everyone on board and find out what's happening. Always take a positive and constructive approach. If you get frustrated along the way, remember, be professional and keep a good attitude. This applies to written communication as well as your face-to-face -face interaction. It can be easy to write things in an email that you would never say to a person's face, but please don't do it. If you come off as petty and hostile, the school will not want to work with you. And be very careful to not burn bridges. You don't know who you're going to have to come back to later on. Engage other parents to help you. Parents have a lot of power in a school district. As you engage with the parent community to show your support, that is what's going to be really the critical mass to move things forward. School leaders are constantly choosing their battles. And if you can show that a majority of parents are supportive, it makes it easier for schools to get on board. Also, learn the process. Attend a committee meeting or a board meeting to understand some of the behind the scenes, what happens, how process and decision is made in your district. Um, sometimes when you don't understand the process, it is very difficult to move something forward because you may bring up something that was discussed two months earlier and it's too late. Some other tips for engaging school groups is to consider the school calendar. Schools go through very predictable cycles every year. Here's an example of a typical school cycle. Your school may be different, but again, like I said, this is an example. August, September is back to school time. Very busy for everybody. The sports seasons are starting. You know, teachers are back in their classrooms. It's a little bit crazy, especially that first two weeks of school. On one hand, people may be very busy. They don't really want to hear anything new at this time. But the other thing to keep in mind is there's a lot of positive energy. Everyone is excited about the start of a new year. New groups are starting. Usually this is the biggest parent meeting of the year for many districts. Take advantage of that energy and engage others in your projects before their time is scheduled up with too many other things. This is a great time to develop relationships, get involved, and really learn what's happening in your district. This is also when fundraising and other projects kick off in many schools. October and November is when everyone has really settled down into the school year. So keep working on those relationships with key people. This is a good time to really plant the seeds for the projects you want to do and begin implementing the project. There also may be some testing going on, in particular state mandated testing during this time. So just be aware of this when you look at the schedule. And December, it's holiday time. This is challenging to get a lot done. And I know many parent groups may not even meet during this month because of just all the crazy stuff that's happening with holidays. But it is a good time to really use this to help build a healthy holiday tradition and think about just building awareness. January and February at the start of the new year usually is a focus for health and wellness for many of us. It's a great time to implement projects, beginning to plan for spring and the following year. Tie in your wellness initiatives with the new year and get people on board. In March and April, we get into the full swing of testing and spring break. In many school districts, the school personnel are focused on testing and may not have much time for anything else. Your parent groups may be planning their future meetings for the next year, their budget for the following year. This is when they're also they're signing some of their fundraising contracts for the following year. So it's a real important time to think about what's happening for the year that's going to follow. In addition, the springtime is when parent groups start to elect their officers for the next year. So again, a time to really look at the connections you've made. And one other thing to keep in mind during March and April is because there's a lot of testing going on, it could be a really good time to plan a fun run, physical activity related project as a reward after the testing is over. May is a nice time to introduce new ideas for the following school year, but many parents and staff are too busy with end of the year activities to try to add new things during this time. This is when a lot of stuff is getting wrapped up. In June and July, as you know, it's summertime. School staff and families are gone, taking a little bit of time with their family activities and vacation. So this is a time, really, to think about 
where things are, where you've been, and possibly thinking about what you need for the next year as you move forward. When you think about doing food-related um, projects, do remember that food is very personal. So we need to be sensitive in how we discuss about food and think about things that aren't impacted by large constraints. Um, for example, the school breakfast program and lunch program have certain federal regulations that go along with them. So that is something that districts have to be very precise with and very prescriptive in terms of what they do. Instead, thinking about something like uh, classroom parties, fundraisers, rewards, athletic events, vending as ways of projects to get started. While you're doing this and learning about how things work, prove to yourself that you can do it and prove to others that you're a powerful advocate and an asset to the school. And really start to look to them for assistance to help as you plan for larger projects. And in turn, they will look to you as being that expert. Making sure that you keep the best interests of children as your top priority. We want to make sure, again, that that's where we're focusing in terms of the health and wellness of the children in our district. And compromise does not mean defeat. Compromises may be looked at as partial victory, but they also lay the foundation for future. You can keep working and building on what you started. Consider the long term. Put in place practices that will ensure your project's sustainability over time. And engaging school groups is really about building relationships. It takes time to get things going. Next, I'm going to share with you a success story of parent champion Sarah Adams. Sarah is the health and wellness chair at her local parent group. And she decided she wanted to get to know the nutrition director for her school district. It just so happened when she took on her position, the current nutrition director was retiring. So Sarah was able to do an exit interview over the phone to get the director's thoughts and ideas about what was working and what needed to improve in regards to healthy nutrition and a healthy environment for the students. So then when the new nutrition director, Maureen, started, Sarah was able to schedule an appointment and meet with her. Before she met with Maureen, Sarah did her homework and set the stage for an effective collaboration. And this is a quote from the school nutrition director that said, Sarah took a genuine interest in her operations and wanted to learn how to best support them. She understood the regulations, supporting us versus coming in and making suggestions on improvements without doing her homework. This automatically created positive communication, mutual respect, and a synergistic dynamic that makes the relationships and projects so successful. In addition, if you look at this collaboration with the Hudson's parent group, Hudson's school system, and the Hudson City School Wellness Committee, that's a mouthful to say, um, Sarah's efforts resulted in a highly successful collaboration with these groups. And the group has actually put on three community health fairs, which get bigger and better every year. The average attendance for each fair is approximately 500 people. If you are looking for some resources to assist you in what you do, here are some that are great to help you out. On the Action for Healthy Kids website, we have the Engaging School Leaders as partners in creating healthy schools. The National Association of State Boards of Education has a resource titled How Schools Work and How to Work with Schools. And of course, Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People. And here is the Action for Healthy Kids website, www.actionforhealthykids.org. At this time, I'm going to remind everyone to enter your questions into the text box, and we can take them at the end of our presentation. I'm going to turn it back over to Amy so she can start on the next section, School Wellness Policy. Great. Thanks, Jill. And I just want to reiterate, as people are entering any questions into the question box, how important it is to not storm the hill, if you will, uh, when working with schools. You must remember that we're all professionals, we're all adults, and so maintaining a mature, collaborative attitude is going to be critical. Uh, we know in our work that there are a lot of impassioned parents, especially around nutrition and physical activity, as well as other things like safety and education. 
you know, if my child's recess were to get cut, I'd be furious about it, but I cannot take that attitude into the school because it just won't go very far. So making sure you're going in in a very collaborative fashion, working with the school to identify challenges, and then the solutions is going to be critical to your success. Uh, okay, so there is a question, and Jill, I'm going to let you answer that one. Are SIPs, school improvement plans, mandatory at all schools? School improvement plans, there are different kinds. Um, so to answer the question, basically, no, they are not mandatory to have this. And every state does things differently. Some may look at the school improvement plan as their part of their performance improvement project, what they're doing in terms of their goals and objectives. And depending on what state you're in, you will have different things that you are looking at. Um, I can give the state of Wisconsin, for example, we have statewide school and district report cards that look at what standards you meet. And districts then will use these report cards to help set their goals for the next year. Um, one other thing that can be used in terms of an improvement plan is many districts have PBIS, or Positive Behavioral Intervention and Support Plan. And there are many places in here that Nutrition and wellness plays a part. It, you know, PBIS is a systemic approach to positive school-wide behavior based on the response to intervention, or RTI model. So these are things that um, you can look at, and many schools will use this type of improvement to say, okay, for a reward, we're going to look at the recess time or some things that way, and it's a perfect way to add that extra exercise into the day and activity. But um, if any concern about what is your district's plan, talk to your state Department of Education staff, and they can help you in terms of learning in your state what is necessary in terms of a improvement plan. Great. Thank you, Jill. We're going to forge ahead. We're going to shift gears a little bit now that you understand how to work within the school institute, the, the important levels and within the school district and school building that you may want to approach. We're going to talk about school wellness policies, what it means to a school, how you can get engaged in implementing a school wellness policy. So you see here a quote from Jean Regaley. She's from the National Dairy Council and happens to sit on our board of directors. We can't go back and make a new start for our children, but we can move forward and make a new end. So let's talk about, um, give, we're going to give you an overview of school wellness policies and how you can use them to accomplish the goals in your school building. Uh, we're going to cover school wellness policy requirements. You're going to know what each district and school needs to accomplish as a result of federal mandates. You're going to understand your district policy, meeting wellness policy goals, and to provide you with some tips for how you can strengthen your wellness policy. So what is a policy and how can it help you with wellness initiatives? Generally speaking, school policies are official statements that address the needs of a school system, a school, or a classroom. They include the values, convictions, and beliefs usually form the basis for a policy statement. You can tell that's the definition pretty much right off out of Webster. Policies generally address what should be done, why it should be done, and who's going to do it. Over time, policies can play a major role in culture changes within a school or a district. The policies are really going to be important to make sure that whatever program you're initiating becomes practice within a school building and that it doesn't have a start and end date. Back in 2004, President Bush signed the Child Nutrition and WIC Reauthorization Act. Again, we're sort of going into the weeds a little bit about the details. But this is information we think is going to be important for you as a parent and as a professional in your knowledge of how to work with schools around wellness policies. This act w uh, required all districts that participate in the National School Lunch Program and Breakfast Program to have a wellness policy in place by July 2006. Notice that I said districts. So we're talking about at the district level, there had to be a single policy. The National School Lunch Program is the federally assisted meal program that operates in public schools. Um, the vast majority of schools in the country do participate in the National School Lunch Program. 
though the vast majority of districts needed to have a wellness policy in place. Uh, the law states that wellness policies had to include guidelines that focused on nutrition, so school, food served within the school campus, goals for nutrition education, physical activity, and other school-based activities, and then a plan for measuring the policy, including the designation of at least one person in the district who is responsible for ensuring that the wellness policy is being implemented. So there had to be one champion at the district level to see this all through. The law also requires that wellness policies be developed and implemented by local parents, teachers, administrators, school food service, school boards, and the public. So the, it was, it's really a grassroots effort. This provides flexibility for local schools and districts to develop policies that meet their unique circumstances, their needs, challenges, and opportunities. So we didn't want cookie cutter policies out there. We wanted policies that were flexible, that allowed students, or excuse me, that allowed schools to meet their unique circumstances. It's important to note that although the policy was mandated as law, it didn't come with any funding or a method of reinforcement. So there was a hole. So it may or may not actually exist in your district. There's been some research that shows that there are wellness policies in the vast majority of school districts across the country. I think uh, the latest is about 80 to 90 percent of schools have uh, a district level policy in place. In some cases, it may exist on paper only. Also, uh, there are no current federal requirements for individual school policy, so it's only at the district level that this policy is required. Some schools have adopted health and wellness guidelines or goals on their own, so they've gone above and beyond, which is fantastic. Some states are beginning to require or recommend that health and wellness goals be included in those school improvement plans or measured as part of the accountability systems we were talking about earlier. So we are making some progress. And then last year, or excuse me, I guess it was in 2010, uh, three years ago already at this point, goodness, the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act was signed into place. And this uh, added new provisions for local wellness policies. It placed greater emphasis on implementation and evaluation. And it required districts to publicly, rep public, publicly report on their progress. So they have to talk about how they're meeting their wellness policy. It has to be included on their website, talked about in newsletters. Uh, and other communications that they may be sending out to parents and students. It also requires periodic assessments, again, that are made available to the public. And now must include goals for nutrition promotion as well as nutrition education. So when we talk about uh, all foods sold on school campus and nutrition education, there has to be a nutrition promotion component as well. So when you look at wellness policies, parents play a key role in helping ensure at the school building level policies are being implemented. You can get involved at the district level if you so choose. Now, as Jill was saying, there is usually a district level school health advisory council that oversees the policy, and parents are certainly welcome to participate in those kinds of activities and are encouraged to do so, actually. But if you want to be more on the ground, if you will, the, working at your local school building on implementing this policy can be just as rewarding. If you want to get involved, here are a couple of tips. First, find and read your district's policy. It's going to be, uh, it, ca it can be sometimes a challenge to find, but if, if you can't find it easily on the website or in a parent handbook, ask the principal, ask a teacher, find out from your PE teacher or food service director or one of the individuals and uh, in the parent groups that you've made connections to, it, where that policy may be. When you're reading through the policy, pay particular attention to the language itself. The, the, the language say suggest or encourage or recommend or say things like school may offer recess in the afternoon and the morning or we encourage that schools offer healthy snacks uh, after school? Or is it stronger? Does it say schools must offer recess once a day? Does it say schools will offer 
snacks that meet specific nutrition standards as part of their after-school program. The language of the policy has a lot to do with the policy strength. So if you're seeing a lot of words like suggest and encourage and recommend or may in that policy, there's a lot of work that can be done to really improve the strength of those policies. And then ask questions. Learn about the development of your district's policy. Find out who was involved in the original creation of the policy. Find out how it was created. Uh, back in 2006, when districts were writing policies, there were a lot of templates out there. It's very possible that your district could have used one of those templates and filed it away without much editing. So learn about how this policy was developed in your school district and figure out ways to make it stronger if you feel it needs it. So some of the other questions that you can be asking are, who's responsible for the policy's implementation? Is it the PE teacher, the food service director, a district level um, administrator? Is, is there a person assigned at each school building that helps achieve the school wellness policy? Are there a group of individuals that help ensure the policy is implemented? Really figure out who's at the helm when it comes to implementation of the wellness policy. Is there any tracking that happens in regards to the policy? Do they track activities and, and correlate them with the wellness policy? Are there processes in place to review implementation of the wellness policy? Meaning, do they have regular review? Are the school health advisory council or school champion, champions taking a look at the policy every six months, four months, and making sure that all aspects are being implemented? When was the last time it was evaluated? Uh, if, if in the some cases, a school district may not have evaluated their wellness policy since 2006. It may be sitting there. And a lot has changed since 2006, including the legislation. So find out when the last time the wellness policy was reviewed by the committee and see if you can't get it back on the agenda if it's been a while. Other questions you can ask. Are teachers and parents aware of the policy? Are they aware of what's included in the policy? Are principals aware of the policy and recommendations are the requirements? And then finally, going back to that school improvement plan, is the policy included in the school improvement plan? The strength of the language within that policy is going to make a big difference when it comes to the inclusion in the school improvement plan. As I mentioned earlier, words like suggest or may aren't going to hold a lot of water when it comes to making sure that it becomes part of the culture. Action step number four. Whether you have a policy that's perfect or have one that needs improvement, improvement use it. Start with what you've got. And when talking to others about your project, mention the goals and the wellness policy that your project will help to meet. So for example, when you go and talk to the principal about recess, have that wellness policy in place and talk about how it helps meet the physical activity requirements of the wellness policy. Uh, taste test, as Jill mentioned, that helps nutrition education, that helps with healthy food served on campus, and also helps with nutrition promotion. So make sure that you're correlating any project ideas that you have back to the wellness policy so the school understands that you're helping to support their goals. If the school hasn't been meeting all of its district wellness policy goals, approach the school leader and again, without being antagonistic, mention that you've noticed the school might need some help. Be empathetic and be solutions oriented when it comes to um, taking the role of helping the school implement those components. So now we're going to talk a little bit about different sections of the wellness policy and ideas that you can use to help meet wellness policies within your local school building. So as we know, as we've said uh, several times now throughout this presentation, and, and really the whole point of us sharing this parent leadership theory is, is because parents have such a powerful role to play, especially in the school building, especially around nutrition and physical activity. Parent-led initiatives can meet wellness policy goals in many, many ways, and parents can often lead these with minimal support from staff. Just buy-in all, is all that's needed in many cases. So here are some ideas to help parents meet 
nutrition education, or nutrition promotion ideas. We've already talked about healthy food tastings. Without fail, every single year we start getting back reports from schools about grants we may have provided to them. And we hear, without fail, that students loved the taste test. In so many cases, they've not seen a whole pear or a kiwi or even whole apples before. And you hear stories about kids thinking that whole pears and the little white cubes they see in canned uh, fruit cocktail. So it's, it's never, um, uh, it never gets old to hear those kinds of stories about how students enjoy taste tests and have learned to, they like certain fruits and vegetables, whole grains and dairy products because of the taste testings and the excitement that's built up around them. As Jill mentioned about the success story in Ohio, health fairs can be a great way <clears throat> to promote and educate the community about healthy eating and physical activity. Invite community partners to help uh, and participate in the health fair. Local hospitals oftentimes can come in and take blood pressure, may even be willing to do cholesterol screenings. Local dietitians can come in and manage a school, uh, booth with nutrition information. Chefs may be interested in doing some cooking demonstrations. Yoga or Zumba, Zumba instructors can come in and help lead some fitness courses. So really engage with community partners to ensure that your health fair is most successful. School gardens are a big project. Uh, lately, the Let's Move initiative and the President, President's wife, Michelle Obama, has done a phenomenal job of encouraging schools to look at school gardens. They're everywhere, and schools can really use them as nutrition education tools, help students understand where food comes from, responsibility in maintaining the garden. There's all kinds of lessons that can be learned in implementing a school garden. Put up educational signage and create opportunities for staff to learn about healthy eating, too. So again, bring in dietitians or other members of the community to do staff development around living healthy lifestyles. Nutrition guidelines, when it comes to um, helping ensure that food served at school is healthy, there is an opportunity for improvement in nutrition guidelines. And with the new school meals rules that took uh, effect last year and the new competitive foods rules that are starting to take effect, there are really strong guidelines that support healthy foods served on school campus. Parents may not control all of these areas because of some of the federal um, requirements for schools, but they can influence and support and advocate to these initiatives. Does your school lunchroom have a salad bar? If not, is there a way to get a salad bar in the room? Is there a grant that may be able to supply the funds necessary to get the salad bar in the school? Work with your food service department and figure out what options may be available. Can you bring more fruits and vegetables to lunch? As I mentioned, the new school meals rules help do that in many, many ways. But there are other opportunities through the fruits and vegetables program where students can have access to snacks throughout the course of the school day. Are there ways to limit unhealthy options in vending and concessions? Uh, you know, the competitive foods rule that came out limits the amount of foods that can be sold during school lunch in some cases, all throughout the course of the school day. So that's certainly helping. But can you talk to school staff and administrators to see if some of the under unhealthy options can be traded out for healthier ones in uh, school vending machines? And then develop healthy snack and celebration guidelines. You know, Jill mentioned classroom parties, especially around the holidays. Is there an opportunity to ensure that what students are being fed at those parties is healthy? And the answer is yes, so look to find ways to infuse health in those kinds of parties as well. One of my favorite stories with regards to parties came out of a school in Georgia near Atlanta in, Fulton, in the Fulton County area. Uh, the school offered a breakfast, excuse me, a birthday party once a month for all students. Um, you know, if your birthday was held in March, they had one giant birthday party. They brought in cakes, cupcakes, cookies to help celebrate. Well, the wellness team was sitting around the table trying to figure out what to do with those parties. Just weren't sure if they didn't want to take them away because students saw such benefit from them and it was such a, uh, a family-friendly opportunity. But they didn't want to continue serving cakes and cookies and, and weren't quite sure if they could afford 
other opportunities. One of the uh, custodians who was um, in the room cleaning at the time actually said, hey, you know what, why don't you just open up the gymnasium and allow students to have access to the equipment and just let them run around and play. They thought it was a fantastic idea. They traded out the cakes and the cupcakes for access to the gymnasium, and the students, not one, complained that they missed their cake or cupcake, and, had a, and they're still having fantastic classroom parties to this day. So it's little things like little changes like that that can make a significant difference to the health of our students. So let's take a look at meeting uh, physical activity goals. Walking school buses, you know, having uh, walking, uh, walkable communities that allow students to bike and walk to school can be huge incentives for um, getting kids physically active. Promote more active recesses. Do you see kids hanging out at the playground or at the tire swing? Are they getting into fights or um, otherwise having behavioral issues because they need a little bit more structure. If any of that is true, consider more active recesses. Look up games and structured activities that can really help ensure kids are busy and are, are being physically active. If you have a lot of students arriving early in the day or staying after school, consider a morning dance class, a morning Zumba type activity, or an open gym that allows students to be physically active before and after school. Look at activity breaks in the classroom, so brain breaks, energizers. The picture there that you see is where students in the classroom get up five or ten minutes and they're being physically active. They're just getting the wiggles out, if you will, and they're really getting blood flowing to their brain. That allows them to focus more in the rest of the day. And then also improve schoolyard and playground facilities. Look for funding. There's lots of grant opportunities around uh, playground refurbishing. If your blacktop is looking really shabby, you know, there may be cracks in the cement, the, the paint has long been faded, there are grants and there are equipment out there that help you refurbish those. And it's a great opportunity to engage other parents in the community to help you do that work. Health promotion. Look at recess before lunch. It's literally just as it says. They offer recess before the kids go out to lunch. It's uh, a very um, easy solution to ensuring that kids don't get out, of, uh, eat lunch in a hurry to get out to the playground and come back all riled up from recess. But instead they go out, get their wiggles out, play hard, they come in, they're ready to eat and consume all of their lunch before they head back into the classroom. It helps with behavior issues, it does help with um, students being more focused in the afternoon. And because they've eaten all their lunch and weren't in such a hurry to go play, they are consuming more of the foods we need them to be consuming. Plan family nutrition nights, sort of like a health fair, but really focused on nutrition. Encourage healthy rewards. So don't look at, 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 at food as a reward. Instead, look at other things like pencils and erasers or even extra recess as reward options for your classroom. TV turnoff week, healthy fundraisers, get in the action events. Again, that's a, a sort of like a playground build or another opportunity where you can bring community members into the fold and helping create a healthy school environment. And then finally, step number five, and when it comes to looking at your wellness policy, is to promote what it is you're doing. One of the things that uh, we can really help schools do is promote all the fantastic programs they have in place. If the members of your school community aren't aware of the activities parents or, and you and school members are doing to help promote student health, spend time helping to market it. Uh, this is a requirement of the Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act, as I mentioned earlier, and that uh, is needed. But there's also fun ways, you know, create materials, flyers, posters, include articles in the newsletter that help spread the word about what it is the school is doing to promote student health and wellness. Ideally, you can market the policy and your project at the same time. So if you're building a school garden, you can talk about how it meets the school wellness policy. Promoting all of your school wellness practices can help you create a wellness identity for your school. And there's positive PR in that. What you're trying to create is a healthy school culture so health is in every aspect of the school day, and it's important to talk about that so parents 
students and community members are aware of it. I'm going to turn it over to Jill, who's going to provide you with steps on strengthening your policy. Thank you, Amy. So you have started using your wellness policy as a platform for change. But what if you want to tackle that policy itself? How do you go about strengthening your policy? First off, join your committee, whether it be the district wellness committee or if your school has a school health advisory council or staff. And attend the meetings and become informed. This way you will learn how the committee works, how things move through the process, and provide input to the district administration. And if for some reason you are unable to join the meeting, talk to the committee members. Provide input that way. Remember, the district is required to have input from local parents, teachers, administrators, school food service staff, school board, and the public who are developing the policy. The Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act adds the requirement that all of these groups, including physical education teachers and school health professionals, are permitted to participate not just in the development, but also in the implementation, periodic review, and update of the policy. When you look at attending the meetings and becoming more informed, really look at also board meetings, other committee meetings, parent meetings, booster clubs, so you really learn how everybody fits together. Booster clubs, for example, may be doing a lot of fundraising. So if they understand the wellness policy, things will work better that way. In addition, when you look at the language of the policy, there's a tool out there called the Welfare Tool. And this helps you really assess the language in terms of how strong. As Amy mentioned earlier, it may say must or shall or will. So you can look at this terminology, and it will help you word what you have in your policy the correct way. If you're looking for more assistance, Action Healthy Kids has a wellness policy tool. And actually, what you're going to see here up on the screen is a preview of the upcoming tool that's on its way. And this is brand new. You're actually the first group here probably that's going to see the public version of it. So if we can have the next slide, Amy. Here it is. You see our, our new wellness policy tool that will be up on the website very soon. This tool um, will help with creation of a good policy with our seven steps to success. You can start with step one or go directly to the step that is relevant to your progress. On each step, you will find objectives, resources, and frequently asked questions to guide you through your wellness policy process. If you're looking to join or start a wellness team at your school and create wellness guidelines specific to your school practices, we have a parent toolkit at actionforallthekids.org. Following a team at the school level will go a long way towards advancing wellness efforts across your district. This does not have to be formal. It can be linked with the district committee. Rather, you're looking to establish health and wellness through a local contact in each school. Participation and support of school leaders, your wellness team, can create school policies and guidelines related to fundraising, rewards, family events, birthdays, parties, recess, and other age-appropriate concerns. That is important to think about that because high school is much different than elementary school in terms of what you're doing for wellness. And look at your district policy and other strong policies that your district or other districts have as a guide. You can visit our Parent Toolkit page for numerous tip sheets on best practices. School Improvement Plan, or SIP, might be called something different at your school. But as you mentioned already, it is usually part of your district's accountability system. Accountability systems operate at the state, district, and school level. And accountability can be a really good place to focus your attention because the teams that work on accountability are generally responsible for the oversight of things like school performance. And they develop these improvement plans to increase student achievement. I want to point out that there is a terminology in here as well that is helpful to be um, aware of. If you talk about a school improvement plan, there are actually school improvement plans required under No Child Left Behind for schools that are in academic improvement status. And these are Title I schools that have failed to meet the guidelines for academic progress two or more years in a row. So if your school is not a Title I school, the terminology school and improvement plan, they might look at you kind of funny and say, what, what is that? You know, we don't have one of those. They could, they might call it something different. 
you might call it their um, accountability plan or their um, other plan that they're doing for assessment in their district. And if you can somehow get wellness goals into the school improvement or academic plan, there's a greater possibility they'll be reviewed and reported on. Keep in mind that you want to present your ideas in a positive way. You want to make it clear that you are a resource, not a complainer. And respect the school leader's authority. Don't try to circumvent them or implement projects or changes to the school culture without the principal or other leader's knowledge or approval. If we look at what is happening at school, here's a wonderful success story from Denver, Colorado. At University Park Elementary, unhealthy foods have become synonymous with school parties, events, rewards, and other activities during the school day. One concerned parent, Rainy Wickstrom, formed a wellness committee and led the charge to create a healthier school. And a quote from Rainy there saying, we needed to shift the paradigm from the top down to create a healthy school culture. And that's really what you need to think about is that school culture and what's happening. The team at University Park created their own wellness guidelines that included the following language. University Park encourages fresh fruit and vegetables at snack time. All events and celebrations involving shared food should focus on healthy offerings. Please do not bring food or beverages for students to share unless by teacher request. Offering food rewards or food coupons for good behavior or performance are discouraged in the DPS wellness policy. And the PTA provides monetary rewards to teachers in lieu of these items. University Park shared two guidelines became the founder, or excuse me, the foundation for a broader wellness program that included physical activity initiatives, a backpack program, and more. This is a really good example of how one school created its own guidelines and used the district policy as a platform for their initiatives. The momentum created by University Park's wellness team had some wonderful results. The students at University Park are consuming hundreds of pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables every year at school. Parents reported that the kids are eating more fruits and vegetables at home. There is a growing awareness that led to a culture shift. And this has been reflected in the foods and beverages brought to school for parties and functions. University Park has won various awards for its wellness program and is referred to as the healthiest school in Denver by the Denver Post. These awards did not come by chance. The school worked hard to promote their success, which led to even more and as you're looking at this for success as well, the learning connection is a great resource from Action for Healthy Kids to help you make that connection between physical activity, healthy eating, and learning. It's an easy to read special report that summarizes the most recent research proving that healthy kids are better learners. In addition, this report is something that you can put in a packet to give to your board members, your principal, and school administrators so that they can be on the same page as you are when you look at wellness at school. We also can look at sharing healthy food and activity at school. Parents, teachers, students, school leaders, and community members can make a lasting impact when we combine efforts. The key to providing children consistent messages around health, nutrition, and physical activity is working together. We at Action for Healthy Kids have a slideshow presentation that you can download and share with your audience. You can use as many of the same slides that are used in this webinar, and you can use it to challenge your school community to share healthy food and activity at school. Additional resources for your use. If you're looking at information on school wellness policies, the USDA information page has this. Um, unfortunately, this page is actually down right now because of the furlough. But um, hopefully, that will be taken care of some things soon, so this page will be back up again so you can get those resources. Again, the WellSet page is here, the Action for Healthy Kids Wellness Policy Tool, and our Parent Toolkit for resources. So at this time, we are looking for questions. And again, please enter them into the question box. And we have one question in terms of when the archived webinar will be available. So we are working to get the archived webinar out in the next 48 hours. And it will be delivered to you via the email you used to register for this session. So uh, it's early as tomorrow, most likely um, probably Thursday at the latest. 
is when you will receive the recording and the resources and handouts that come, that come with this slide presentation. There's another question in here too about is there a specific requirement as to what needs to be included in the wellness policy or is it left up to the school? This individual is working with three schools. One has two lines on their wellness policy. The other two have pages within their wellness policy. Let me go back to the slide that talks through what needs to be included in wellness policy. Bear with me for just a second. So there are requirements as to what's included in the wellness policy focused around nutrition education, uh, nutrition um, uh, food served at school, oops, a little bit too far, uh, physical activity, um, and then plans for measuring uh, success. And then with the 2010 Healthy, Free Hungry, Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act, it required nutrition promotion goals as well. So there are some requirements that had to be met within those um, the wellness policies. One other requirement that is there is a requirement with the new 2010 Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act that districts report out on their implementation. That is what you've done in your wellness policy work over the past year. Um, when you look at this question here about the differences, differences in districts, the policy in some districts might be very short, and very straight to the point and then all the details are in their corresponding procedure that the district may have. So that is something to look at if you're looking at the wellness policies, making sure you look at the procedure as well. And one thing that um, I would encourage everyone to do when you look at the policy procedure is look at who owns the policy. Many times the policy is owned by the board. That means the board makes changes in the policy, but the procedure may be owned by administration. That is, administration is in charge of the implementation and making the changes in it. So that distinction can make a difference in terms of where you go for the final improvement plan that you have for your wellness, as well as suggestions for making changes. Great, thank you. So Action for Healthy Kids offers many resources to professionals and parents and community members that want to work with schools to help create healthy learning environments for kids. Uh, one thing you can do to gain access to all these resources is simply take our Every Kid Healthy Pledge. We're working to create a 100,000 person movement of parents, moms, dads, students, professionals, and other community members that all have the common goal of creating healthy, healthy school environments. Go to actionforhealthykids.org slash everykidhealthy. It takes about 10 seconds. And once you've signed on, we'll continue providing you with resources, big and small, that can help you turn your commitment to action in your local school environment. So we'd like to thank you for joining us today. Uh, please go back to our website again, actionforhealthykids.org. We are continuing to offer the Parent Leadership Series. The next session is going to be offered in a couple of weeks, and we'll focus on um, building a wellness team in your school community and then how you can assess your school's environment. So we're going to continue helping you understand how to navigate the school wellness uh, environment. So thanks again for joining us. We will be sending out the recording of this session within the next 48 hours. And thanks to Jill for her expertise. Everyone have a great afternoon. Take care.